Soul Disconnected podcast, a platform designed to reconnect us, bring us back to a common ground to understand one another. Open about our flaws and failures, focused on growth and positivity, the flame in the dark that burns in our soul. Check, check. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. What's up, everybody? You are now tuned in to episode 10 of Soul Disconnected Podcast. This one's called Portraits with Jose Alvarado, the one and only Jose Alvarado. What's up, my brother? <laughs> How you doing today? I'm doing all right, man. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you for coming on. Of course, uh, man. I appreciate you and, and Ashley and, and her mama. You know, having me out here, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's always a blessing when we get to see uh, relatives, family, and people that do cool stuff. Yeah, that's man. That's why I brought you on. You're pretty cool. You're interesting. Uh, well, thank you, man. I I, I think I'm not that interesting, but that's all good, man. <laughs> uh, you know, from from our perspective, we don't see it that way, but I've always uh, thought you were kind of a comedian. Oh, you know? yeah, man. <laughs> You've always been, laughing, the life man. Of, you always been the life of the party. Yeah, I'm, I was kind of the class clown. Oh, yeah. yeah no. That was definitely me, too. Yeah, man. And so we hit it off uh, from the start. Oh, <laughs> no. big time, man. Big time. I remember teaching you that one line from Nirvana on the guitar, man. Yeah, yeah. I still play it every now and then. Yeah. I'm a, I still think I'm a guitar player. Yeah, me I too. Because <laughs> I can I jam suck, out. Though. I can't play nothing. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I try to practice every now and then, but I don't know if I have the patience. But I need to. I want to learn an instrument before I die. That's oh, my yeah, ultimate man. goal. You know what would be badass to play is the trumpet. A little oh, bit of jazz. Oh, oh man. man, hell yeah! Any yeah. any any air instrument, any wind instrument would be amazing. Oh That'll, yeah, a man. sax or a, a sax, trumpet. Sax looks hard. <laughs> I'm good with the trumpet. It's just three little things. You just, you know, <laughs> get some miles man. in, huh? There you go. That'd be badass. So, you know, I brought you on today to talk a little bit about your photography. But okay. before we get into that, um, where where are you from originally? I was born in Ensenada. 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 And then I was snuck over when I was like four years old. How did they get you over here? Uh, I was asleep. It was uh, me and my sister. We were asleep in the van and they went through the border at night. So nice. we wouldn't be awake and they wouldn't wake us up and ask us, you know. Questions. Yeah. And then uh, we came over and the first place we stopped was at Denny's. And uh, they said, oh, what do you want? And I was like, menudo. <laughs> like, they ain't got menudo and no Denny's, man. <laughs> you know, so, it's crazy. They probably do now. <laughs> uh, yeah, right? I ain't been to Denny's in yeah. a while, though. They probably do now, but back then, yeah. they were like, menu what? <laughs> what, the, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, man. Yeah, man. So, so we were brought over, and then uh, um, I think we lived in like Highland Park mm -hmm. for a little bit, and then we moved to Rosemead. And uh, that was it. That's where I grew up. Do you remember how old you were when you came over here? I want to say I was like four. Wow. But I'm not positive. I know I was young. It was before you started school, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know any English at all. Do you remember that, the transition to learning English? Or nah. you were just so young then, huh? I was so young, man. You know, kids these days, everybody picks it up. Like quick. anything. They can pick up anything real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, so I must have picked it up somewhat, but not too great because I was in ESL for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is like when when I was young, we moved around a lot. So when I moved back towards my grandma's house, um, they put me in an ESL class because they had no room in the other classes. And really? I, you know me, I understand it, <laughs> understand Spanish somewhat pretty good, but I can't speak it that well. So I had a hard time being in that class. Yeah, I man. was like. I was like, like I just stuck out like a sore thumb. Well, much. I was a knucklehead in in school, man. I didn't like, uh, it it didn't catch my attention. You know, the teachers really didn't. Um, I don't know, man. They didn't they didn't come out and make it fun for me, I guess. And uh, so I always had a hard time in school. So you were just like easily distracted, pretty much. Oh hell yeah, <laughs> man! I barely graduated. <laughs> I bar seriously barely graduated, man. So you would say, like, what what was your childhood and teenage uh, years like? Um, to be honest, they were depressing, man. I was uh, I grew up pretty depressed. Um, I had a lot of like emotional issues mm -hmm. growing up, and um, and I was kind of a social outcast. Yeah. I didn't play sports and I didn't wasn't into 
the things that were popular at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and we were poor, so I wasn't dressed to the, the to tea. the T. Yeah. And uh, so I stood out kind of like just I was pretty Different. much a loner, man. And, yeah. And uh, it, it was it was difficult, but it made me stronger when I grew up. Yeah. And you just I think at, as we get older and when we become adults, you start to realize that some shit it's not even that important no more. Yeah. But when you're yeah. young, especially when you're a kid in school and then you get into the the higher ages in, in school, as far as high school, middle school, you start to get around a lot more judgmental people. Some kids have more than others. And then it's like what's trendy. And if you're not on the bandwagon, you just automatically stand out to them. Oh, yeah, man. Like, like I can remember just being so awkward. Like, I'd go to high school parties um, and I just... Did not fit in, bro. I just did not fit in. But you know what? It made my uh, photography uh, that much easier mm-hmm. uh, when I went out and do uh, street portraits or or just taking pictures of whatever. It mm-hmm. made it easier because I was already used to being alone. So it was kind of like I wasn't noticed. Yeah, and it makes you, it makes you more comfortable in that realm, and then you can maneuver easily. Yeah, and it's just like you and your camera. And then it made me, um, it made it easier for me to approach, uh, like the, it's kind of objective to say, but like the poor people, mm-hmm. uh, like I, I, I clicked with them, mm-hmm. and it was easier to, to uh, approach them mm-hmm. because I was the same way. Yeah. And uh, like approaching rich people is just not my not my thing. Like, yeah, yeah. I feel uncomfortable. Yeah. But uh, anybody with, like low income or whatever, it's easier because I have things in common. Common. With them. Yeah, yeah. You know, re- you're, you're re- you can relate to them in, in yeah, a lot of ways. Yeah. And so it, it was cool. After after high school, you you joined the military, right? Yeah, I was working at uh, Del Taco, and uh, I right out of high school got a job at Del Taco, and that's where I met my wife. And um, and then I was working at the one in Rosemead, and then I went to the one in Almani on at the the what is it the Five Corners or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was working nights, and I was kind of like, "What am I gonna do with my life?" You know, I didn't mm-hmm. have photography at the time, and um, I was just stuck. Mm-hmm. And I, I know I wasn't smart enough to go back to school because that's mm-hmm. just did my my thing, and. Uh, my sister went in, and I was like, "Damn, if she can do it, I can do it." Mm-hmm. And uh, funny thing uh, is, uh, I went to a psychic. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It was an, uh, we. My wife and I went to uh, Old Town and uh, Old Town Pasadena, and we were walking around. And one of the alleys was a was a palm reader. Uh huh. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna test this girl. <laughs> so I, I was like, all right, let, let's do this. And she's like, okay, but don't hand me no money yet. And you know, just put out your palm or whatever. And she's like, I see you in a uniform over mountains and oceans and this and that. And I was like, girl, you crazy. I ain't trying to do all that. <laughs> I'm like, you lying right now. And I uh, uh, gave her the money and I was like, ah, I just blew it off. And then uh, a couple weeks later, mm-hmm. um, uh, there was an incident at the Del Taco I was working at. It was super busy and this drunk guy came up and, he was uh, making a scene, and I was like, "Man!" And I was—I had a bad attitude at the time. Mm-hmm. I was a snapper; like <laughs> I would like literally, you know, want to start fights. Mm-hmm. And um, and he said some stuff, and I was like, "Man, f you, get out of here! I ain't giving you nothing." And mm-hmm. uh, he got all mad, left, whatever. And uh, like two weeks after that, um, I ended up leaving Del mm-hmm. Taco. I joined the military. And uh, I gave myself three months to to uh, before I went in, so I can exercise and, and get ready. So that transition wouldn't be so tough. Yeah, and uh, that the weekend after I left, that place got held up, and the guys that I used to work with, when I went back and picked up my last check, they said the guy was looking for me, and he had a gun. And it was that guy. The it same was guy? that same guy. Oh wow! And it was kind of like meant to be, right? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, dude. So I uh, started getting ready for the military, and uh, I would I I went to the gym, or actually I went to the high school, 
mm-hmm. and I said, all right, I'm going to run around the track. I'm going to do like a mile. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you just keep progressing. Mm-hmm. Well, I ran half a bl- half a lap and started throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was ridiculously out of shape. And mm-hmm. then, so by the time I went in, I was running five miles a day. Mm-hmm. So when I went in, it was easier. What branch did you serve? I was in the army. I was in the uh, infantry. Uh-huh. What? Uh, where were you stationed at? Um, I did basic training in Fort Benning, Georgia, uh-huh. and then they give you three choices when, when, or they used to. I don't know if they do now, but mm-hmm. they they used to give you three choices of uh, where you'd like to go. Mm-hmm. I picked uh, like Germany, um, Korea, and Hawaii, and then I forgot what else. Uh, like one local, mm-hmm. and um, they ended up sending me to Korea, mm-hmm. and I was in Korea for a year. I think it's different now, but back when I was in, it was uh, just a, you served a year there, and then you went somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And uh, Korea was a eye opener, man. That really taught me a lot. Oh wow! Yeah, it was. It was. Um, I had a bad attitude still, and when I got there, I met this. Um, one sergeant and him and I bumped heads like crazy. So even during basic training and and all that, you were still getting into it with the staff um, or not? No, so no. In basic training, uh, I I went under the radar. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be known. I didn't want to be, you know, anything. I just wanted to get through it. It was all mental. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of pe- a lot of guys couldn't make it. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. I, we, there was this one guy. And he had the mentality of a 13-year-old. I don't know how he made it that far, but he um, he tried to kill himself. Wow. Um, sticking, sticking his hand in a fan or something like that. And uh, it was just, it's just a mental game. It Basic bro- training got, is all mental. It got to him, huh? Yeah, he couldn't handle it. And um, uh, I think that, that going in, I wanted to, go under the radar in basic training Uh and I didn't really think about adjusting my attitude um, but uh, Sergeant did (laughs) (laughs) when I got to Korea because when I got to Korea it was crazy Mm -hmm. it was just like in the movies you know everybody was drunk all the time and just going crazy Mm -hmm. and um, I bumped heads with this one Sergeant who uh, just showed up and was like giving us orders I was like man F you this and that whatever and uh, he ended up being one of my best friends there. Wow. And he, he helped me out a lot and uh, corrected my attitude adjustments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we need that a swift yeah. kick in our ass sometimes. Yeah, it was awesome. It was um, awesome. I hated Korea, though. You you didn't, you didn't. said you were out at uh, Guantanamo Bay, too, right? Yeah, yeah. How after, long? After Korea, I went back. I was stationed in Washington State. And then... Uh, How would you like Washington? Uh I liked the area. The, it was nice, mm-hmm. uh, but there was a lot of racism there. Oh in wow! The, in that in that Fort, uh, what is it, Fort Lewis? Yeah, I saw a lot of racism. Oh, that's scandalous! So. Yeah, man, uh, it was it was tough. It was tough, and then we ended up getting shipped out to uh, Guantanamo for uh, to uh, guard refugees that were coming into our country. Wow! And uh, that was a trip. You you were stationed at the prison? Um no, it was like um um like camps. Mm-hmm. They were like just camps of families. Well, and you I, guys had to oversee them. Yeah, we got to make sure they, they ain't trying to escape. Wow. And uh a lot of them were cool, man. They would come over and into our camps and then they'd uh do the gardening and stuff and you get to know them. Mm-hmm. And uh what type of refugees were th- were they? Uh, the section that we had was all families. From uh, what? Where were they from, escaping from? Uh, they were escaping from Cuba, and we had Somalians, mm-hmm. um, and I, th- I think that was it for us, mm-hmm. for our little section. But um, they were really cool people. They would offer you their food. They would uh, offer you their drinks, whatever they had. They, you know, they were appreciated. Damn, that's cool. Yeah, it was cool, but. Oh man, when I worked at the hospital there, oh bro, that's just, that was wild. It was, that bad. was wild, man, <laughs> dude. There was these crazy people there, man. That legit oh, like crazy. Skits. Well, they were trying to get to the U.S., so uh, they they knew that 
there was certain things that they uh, Guantanamo that they couldn't do that it, they'd have to ship you to Florida mm-hmm. to uh, help you out. Mm-hmm. And once they ship you to Florida, they're not going to ship you back. Mm-hmm. So they would do crazy things. Like there was one guy who uh, shoved a straw in the hole of his penis oh. and then uh, blew like throw up in it. So he got infected. So they had to take him to Florida. Damn. Yeah, it was nasty, that's bro. That's crazy. Yeah, People are doing anything they can. Huh? Anything, bro. Like anything. And there was this one dude, I remember, he he was crazy. Like he kept coming up and uh, saying, asking if I was Jesus. And and he he was just weird. And I, he, every day, he'd come up to me at least 50 times a day. Be like, hey, man, are you Jesus? Are you Eres, Eres Jesus? I'm like, man, no, man. I got tired of it. I finally said, no, man, I'm the devil. That fool never never bothered me again. <laughs> but he did that. And then uh, there was one dude, uh, he, he used to like to masturbate all the time. And oh, he'd do wow. it like out in the open, like in front of everybody. Oh, and yeah. they told us, don't let him do it. I'm like, well, I ain't going to go over there and touch the fool. <laughs> you know? I'm like, nah, bro. I'm, they we, they told us to get him out of the shower one time. I was like, nah, dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, I was nah. like, hey, you, yeah, stop, dog. <laughs> and so they start calling him the Guantana- Guantanamo Bay Stroker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was crazy over there. I was there for like, uh, I think it was like five and a half months, and then got uh, sent back to Washington and just mm-hmm. finished out my time there. Nice. So overall, how was your experience? Did it feel like a long time, or did it um, freeze by? The first year, I think, was the best year. Because I learned so much, I was aw- the first time I was away from like everything I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, it made me grow up quick, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, it was just like those guys. I think there's like one or two guys that I still talk to mm-hmm. that I spent time there, and um, it was just it was an amazing bond. It was everything that I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Like as far as like brotherhood and stuff, and I never have brothers, so it, it gave me that sense mm-hmm. of, of brotherhood. And then uh, Washington was was I hated Washington mm-hmm. uh, just because of all the racism. You know, there there was a lot of uh, white guys that were bullied mm-hmm. and uh, growing up, and it was their turn to be a bully. I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. Because uh, when I remember when I was getting out, the captain was like, "Why don't you stay?" And I. You know, promote you to a sergeant or whatever, and I was like, no, I was like, they'll always be above me. Like, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, and that'll make a difference. Yeah, I was like, it ain't worth it to me. Yeah, you know. Well, but I'm glad I did it. I'm yeah, I'm they're, super they're, glad. to be able to get the experience and to to change your perspective and outlook on life and gain some, you know, self respect and see things differently is always a, a useful tool. Especially like when you get out into the society. Oh yeah, you know the, the the crappy thing is when I got out, it took me over six months to find a job. That's that's crazy. It took me over six months. I felt so degraded, man. And I remember, I remember, I got into this one dude. It was a white guy who, who gave me some lip one time, mm-hmm. and um, and I went up to him and I said, "Hey, man," I said, "You ever served for uh, for your country?" And he was like, no. And I was like, well, I'm not even a citizen. And guess what? I served for your country, so you owe me some fucking respect. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I did what you can't. Yeah. So next time you walk by, you better not say anything. Yeah. And he, I never saw that fool again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes people just talk out of their ass. And yeah, it's crazy. man. It's, it, it doesn't it, make no sense. It's like, dude, man. <laughs> well, get your head out your butt, man. That's yeah. it. Yeah, really, though. Would you say um, throughout your life or, you know, before, you, it could be any time, point in time or even now, like, what would you say your biggest fear is? My biggest fear is, um, to be honest, my biggest fear is for my kids to follow my footsteps. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I'm struggling, you know, check to check, like a lot of us are. Yeah. You know, we live check to check. We don't, we don't have... Uh, the college degrees or, or, you know, the context for great jobs and this and that. Or like the comfort money or anything. Yeah, just like we don't no have blanket, that. No extra blanket of anything. Yeah, and I mean, my, don't get me wrong, my kids don't go without, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to tell them like... You just want them to do more for themselves. Yeah, like, uh, and I think that kind of bit me in the butt a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I, I pushed them so hard. Mm-hmm. 
But that's just my fear. And I tell them all the time, it's like, look, I don't want you to end up like us. Mm -hmm. You know, I want you to take vacations and travel and see the world and enjoy life, not work for, you know, paying off your bills. Mm -hmm. But Yeah, that's that's I guess that's what all like any parent would want is for their their children to progress and be better than them and not, you know, not continue like a cycle. And I feel like I feel like we all end up doing that at some point or another until it like clicks and then when something clicks it, you may be able to adjust it a little bit it doesn't mean you have to be perfect or stray completely away because there's good traits that we learn from our parents so even though like we grow up and sometimes we're we're around crazy shit or see things oh, that we're yeah. not really happy with but you pick up some you know sometimes we pick up some bad habits or good habits along the way but sometimes those good habits are what make you a better person in, in the end yeah well yeah. you know one thing about parenting is we always try to correct the mistakes that we think our parents made. And by doing so, we make our own mistakes. Mm-hmm. And that's just the cycle of the way it goes. Part of think, learning yeah. it, too. The yeah, best thing man. is to try to learn from the mistakes we make. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, Sometimes it takes us a few times. <laughs> oh, man, I'm telling you, man. Like, like uh, for example, like I grew up and uh, with, with my, my stepdad and my, and my mom, and they didn't really say I love you all the time. Mm. And so when I was growing up, I told myself, um, when I have kids, I'm going to let them know I love them every day. I don't care. Mm. You know, We're, there's not going to be a day that goes by that you don't say I love you. Mm-hmm. And to this day, we, we don't leave the house without saying I love you, you know, and we always give kisses. We we hug each other. We, you know, we're we're really a good bond. Affectionate too. Yeah. And I, I feel like, that I think I think that but showing affection and when you speak to your children or amongst family positive words it, it's like it's almost like you don't need it but it's an extra boost of reassurance and confidence and I think when you go out in the world it just makes you feel like a better person you know what I mean just yeah. just hearing that and just feeling that before you step out into the world because home should be like the the base home base should be the foundation and yeah, that that's makes what, that's everything you, that's work. your support system exactly and it has to be comfortable and it has to be like really really warm so that because the, the world's cold you step out your door you, oh yeah you man, don't know what ruthless. the hell yeah you don't know what the hell you're gonna deal with mm-hmm. but then you come back home and that's got to be like the home like home base foundation warmth and just positivity and love like you need to make sure home's good then everything else could be everything else oh yeah man i mean you like I like I told my uh, my kids, it's like, look, you know, I don't I don't want you to have a relationship like me and my siblings because mm-hmm. we ain't close. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, it's it's not like we fight every time we get together. We, I mean, we we get along, we love each other, but we're just not close. And at the end of the day, too, sometimes we're as people, we're just different, and um, we grow apart. And that's what's it's sad, but at the end of the day, we're once you become an adult and then you may like something or another person may like something like you grow apart and it's just so weird sometimes to know that it happens within family. Oh, but you yeah. see it with friends, you see it with coworkers, you see it with people that you've known your whole life and sometimes you grow apart or you just grow in different directions and it's just so taboo and weird because sometimes we feel as family like we all need to stick together, we need to be bonded together, we need to be in each other's faces every day but honestly that's not the case. The case is just like can we communicate well and can we try to work around the differences? That's that's the biggest step. But I just think as people, we grow apart. And I, a part of me, I feel like we it's not completely wrong, but a part of it, too, we have to work on it ourselves, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just communication and just getting past all. We all have bullshit, all of us. Oh, hell yeah. And we all have our own problems and shit. And I just feel like working that out and then setting time aside where... We all come together and family, you know, you have to make time for that. But I feel like it's okay if you grow apart or, you know, every now and then checking in, you know, every now and then being affectionate or whatever. But I feel like you don't always have to be in everybody's face. And I feel like it's, sometimes it's nice that to miss somebody. Because yeah. if you see someone consistency, consistently, it's like it's like you, you see them all you, the time. You take it for granted. 
Yeah, but then when it's like someone doesn't come around for so long, it's like it's really a genuine good feeling to see that person. Like, damn, like I haven't seen you in yeah, so long. And kind of like us, we yeah, we, yeah. You know, when we see each other, we're like, "What's up?" Yeah, it's just like it's it feels genuine. It feels good, and, it, and it, it, you just in that moment, it, all the memories, good, you know, some sad and everything, because you just it's family. You're just seeing the life cycle flash before you and everything, and it's just nice to see that. And sometimes, like I said, like. I think we all go through it with siblings. Like, you know, oh, yeah, on my behalf, man. I have siblings all over the place <laughs> from my mom's side and dad's side. And I feel bad sometimes because I don't, I don't make enough time, but I, I'm, I'm always doing something. But I know myself, I need to make time to, to try to see everybody. But like I said, I have siblings here, I have siblings there, all over the place. And sometimes I'm like, damn, like, how am I going to be able to make time to see all of them with yeah. a different, are different parents, but we're all combined and related at the end of the day, but there's so many of us. Yeah, man. That. And like and like I, I tell my kids like, you know, always be close. Always be close. You'll always have each other. When your mom and I are gone, you're gonna have each other. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh I, I it's kinda jacked up that I don't do the same with my sisters, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean I reach out to them, I'll snap them or or, or send a, a message through Instagram or whatever, you know, but it's mostly uh, some some funny shit that I said. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. You've always been the clown, though. You've always been able to make everybody laugh. Smiles. Yeah, man. Well, you know what? It, I think laughter is key, bro. Mm-hmm. You know? You got you to gotta <laughs> laugh through life, man. You know what's funny, though? It's like I, I can relate to you because like you, at times, like you said, you felt like a social outcast or like the class clown. I feel like I was the same way. I felt awkward in ways, and then but it's like I, I do anything to make people laugh. Oh yeah, not man, like, I've done some not dumb like stuff. some crazy, crazy <laughs> stuff, but like just shit that'll just make random people just laugh. Sometimes you just meet people, like gain friends just from making someone laugh, and they didn't even know who you were. Oh you're yeah, just being man. a clown, Big you know? time, bro. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, uh, I think laughter is a big part of uh, like my family. Mm-hmm. Uh, we always pull pranks on each other and stuff, <laughs> and uh, we always try to scare my daughter. Jessica, we always try to scare the hell out of her, man. That shit is so funny. Uh, uh, I got to put them on YouTube one of these days, man, when I find the videos. They're hilarious. <laughs> um, but, like, we pull pranks on each other. Like, um, uh, you know those little poppers that everybody buys at the 99 cent yeah, store yeah. or whatever? Like, if somebody goes to the bathroom, <laughs> uh, we wait a little bit, and then we put it under the door, and then we pop them all at the same time, scare the hell out of people, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice. just stupid stuff like that. I gotta man. try that one. Of these days. It's hilarious, bro. They get you literally so mad. scare the shit out of them. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny until they do it to you. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Then you're like, "Hey, stop playing!" <laughs> you're like, hey, come on, are you looking? <laughs> <laughs> so, what inspired you to get into photography? Um, I've always liked like the art, mm. and uh, I I remember uh, way way back, like in maybe probably eighth grade. Mm-hmm. I used to go to the library, and I would go to the library, and I'd look at all these magazines, and I'd be fascinated by these like fashion portraits and and uh, or these celebrity pictures that you see everywhere, and uh, it was awesome. I used to steal them, man. I used to <laughs> go to the library and I'd steal those pictures. I didn't know why at the time. I was just like, I'm fascinated by this photo, and uh, until I got caught, <laughs> I got caught one time, man. And, uh, Library, the lady was so mad, she uh, kicked me out for life. <laughs> what library was that? Uh, uh, the one in Roseme, right down the street from my where I grew up. And um, and then uh, one one day, I I told my wife, I was like, "Look, I, I'd like to get into it. Mm. You know, it'd be pretty cool." So she bought me a, a a camera, and it was a film camera at the time. And I took pictures, and I remember I didn't have the patience to see what you know, what I, what pictures I took or whatever. And, um, so I ended up buying a digital camera Mm -hmm. and, and then I started doing, uh, portraits like of just my family, whatever, friends, whatever I could, uh, find. I, I learned to use like lighting that you typically don't use for lighting, Mm -hmm. uh, for photography but I didn't have the money at the time, so you, you do with what you got. Exactly. And uh, I just would put up uh, fabric backdrops, and I'd use the lamps that my mom had. And, you know, I just started learning here and there. And then I started picking up Photoshop and and 
like every beginner, you over Photoshop everything. And you <laughs> think it looks cool, but it really don't. It really look like garbage, man. But it's all about the process, though. Trial oh, yeah, and error. Man. Then you start to then like I think I'm sure where you're at now, it's like you're doing more with less. And then in the beginning, you were doing yeah. so much because you're like, yeah. oh, it needs in the this, beginning, it needs you're that. like, oh, I need this, I need that, and this and that. And yeah, and then you start to realize all it takes is less, and the more natural you make something look or feel, it's like boom, that's yeah. it. It's key. Like I listen to a lot of podcasts all day, and um, a lot of uh, film ones film photography ones and they always say um you know you don't really need the most expensive equipment all you need is your imagination and Mm -hmm. to go out and and do it yeah and uh i'm I'm finding out that's pretty true you know i i like to go out with uh, as less as possible and you i I think i create more memories than anything Mm -hmm. you know the people i meet is amazing and that's what's cool too because it's a whole experience in itself because you're taking a picture, and sometimes, like you said, you're taking pictures of complete strangers, and then the photo itself tells a story, plus you get to pick their brain and talk to them and see what's going oh, on yeah, in their mind. yeah, man. Like, there was this one dude, uh, recently I went out, and it was, uh, um, I forgot what festival it was. It was in Overa Street, and I was walking around, and there was this guy, and he was dressed all in white, and he looked like the dude from Jurassic Park. Like, <laughs> like the old dude, yeah, from the, he, yeah the he creator looked like of the him. park. Yeah, he looked like him. He had this nice hat, and and he looked really nice. And I approached him, and I was talking to him. And then I said, "Hey, can I take your picture?" And he was like, "Sure, but um, let me ask you, why do you want to take my picture?" And I said, "Because I like your look. You know, you're dressed all nice, and you got this great hat, and you know, I got to know you a little bit, and it's cool." And he's like, "Okay," and so I snapped a couple pictures i love those pictures and um then i really got to know him and it was sad this this man was living in a homeless shelter oh wow and uh but he's dressed by the way he's dressed you could never tell just a really clean guy he's a real clean guy and he he was uh really depressed and he said that uh he, he had a drinking pro- problem back back in the day mm-hmm. and his wife and his daughter had left him and wow. they went to mexico and then his sons live up north, but they won't talk to him because Damn. all the it things got, he did, it, I guess, when he was drinking. Yeah, the drinking got bad. Yeah, and uh, but he, he came around, and he was, I mean, he was a genuine good guy to me. And uh, so we sat there, and we talked for like a good hour, mm-hmm. you know, and got to know him really well. And I, I gave him my number, and I said, brother, if you ever need anything, just food or Someone to talk to, give me a call. Man. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm like 15 minutes away. I'll come by. Yeah, that's you know? cool. Yeah, it's real cool. You know, you make that cool connection. Yeah, and it's always nice to connect. And that's, what's, that's what I was going to add to, like, what we were talking about, like, earlier. Sometimes you can connect with complete strangers. Oh, and man. You, and, you, and you don't have that same connection with people you know every yeah. day. Yeah, and you know? I find that a lot, man. <laughs> it's just because you, you, you realize you have a lot more in common with people than you think. And then the, the problem, the whole narrative is like you think like, or the way we're taught is like you're supposed to assume the people you know in your whole life that you're supposed to just spark with them every time. But yeah. that's not the case. You're two different people. That's and true. And you may have a lot more in common with complete strangers than you do with people that you've known forever. Yeah. Well, I started doing street photography before it got bi- and like busy and before it got popular. Mm-hmm. And it was easier. And mm-hmm. I would go. And my my goal every time is approach 10 strangers mm-hmm. and ask for a picture. And if they say no, you say, well, thank you very much. Have a great day. And you walk away. And around the corner, somebody's going to say yes, you know? Exactly. I mean, but it, it does eat, eat at you a little bit in the beginning. When they say no, you're like, oh, man, I want to go hide under a rock. Yeah, <laughs> the rejection part is, like, tough. It's it's hard when you're trying to approach people and promote something or ask for something, you know? Yeah. And you don't, they, you know, you really don't want nothing in return. You're just trying to do yeah. something that adds value to your life, but... It, the rejection part's the hardest, but I think when you get used to the no's, it just starts to become easy. Like, all right, the no no's make the yeses uh, even better. Yeah, it makes it yeah. more rewarding. Exactly, it does, man. How many years uh, of experience do you have doing that? Um, I started in 2007. I started uh, with photos, and then uh, I just now started doing uh, uh, film photography, nice. like the old school stuff. And uh, I'm in love with it, man. It, it's it kind of lit another fire 
Nice. For, and for it, the love. it sparked your inspiration some more, huh? Oh, yeah, man. It's not, You know what? Uh, I think I was looking through old photo books, and I was like, man, you know, you don't, people don't do this no more. Mm-hmm. And then um, what actually was funny was I was – I was the guy that was like, why would you want to do film when, when you got digital and you can see it right away and this yeah. and that? And then I started seeing all these film photographers and I was like, well, let me see what they got. Let me let me see what the big deal is about. And I bought a camera and I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> I was like, this is beautiful, man. I love the images that it, 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 it makes. It's just like a real genuine shot and it just has a, a different look to it. Yeah, huh? it's like... it. Digital doesn't come close to you, it. You man. can't even duplicate the image, huh? You no. can you can mess with the effects. You can try to get a vintage look to it, but it's not going to match. It's not going to give that you the style. same. Yeah. The same. Like old old certain old cameras put out a, a look that you can't duplicate. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's just beautiful. beautiful do you, do you remember the first thing you shot um, when you first started? And do you remember the first thing that you shot doing film photography? Um. Well, when I first started, my first camera was a film photography camera, and I remember I did. Uh, I lived up in Victorville, mm-hmm. and I was. Uh, I, I ended up going down to these rocks, and uh, I tried to do like landscape shots. And there was a train that was coming, and I remember trying to take pictures of the train. Mm-hmm. I don't think I ever developed that role. Mm-hmm. And uh, w- when I did my digital, I, I believe the first picture I made was was probably my wife. And then um, recently, when I picked up my cameras, the first pe- the first roll was a black and white roll, and it was of the cats. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have two cats, and uh, I was so excited, and nobody would pose for me, so I said, "Screw it, I'm just gonna shoot these cats." <laughs> and the pictures turned out horrible, man. And I didn't know what I was doing at the time, mm. and uh, so I, you know, it took me like five five or six rolls of film to actually get the hang of it uh, understand what i was doing wrong nice yeah now it they're turn out beautiful man and as far as you taking photos with your vintage film uh cameras how what do you remember the first shots you took and your most favorite shots um right now my most favorite shot is of the starlight drive-in theater oh, nice. the one we were talking about earlier yeah yeah uh that one was one of my favorite ones so far, and I have it up on my wall already. You know what? What seems like exciting is like now we live in such a, a world, a generation where everything's so quick. And if you take that digital shot, you can see it right away. You take that shot with your phone, you see it right away. Then you can doctor it up or whatever. Yeah. You taking the film shot, you have to wait till it develops to see. Then yeah. you see your end result, and you're like, oh shit, this is a great yeah. photo. You, you know, know what? Like, it was funny. Is I don't I. I didn't remember I had that picture in that role. Uh-huh. So when I got the film developed, I was like, "Oh, snaps. I forgot all about this picture." And it was <laughs> um, it was fun. It was fun and I remember I remember exactly when I took that picture and everything. It just made it, you know, that much better. Man, that's yeah, nice. Man. What um what would you say motivates you to to pursue this to like the start of it? And what really motivates you to keep going, to want to wanna continue growing in photography and doing it? Well, when um, growing up, I was always like artistically inclined. Like uh, I, I did piano mm-hmm. and uh, like, I love to draw and I like to write poetry and stuff like that. And uh, I figured this was a, a way to express myself. Nice. You know, um, photography is a, a beautiful way to, to, express who you are and what you love and all that and the cool thing is man you ain't got to share it to uh, with everybody like you can just you can keep, keep it, keep it, it personal yeah. yeah and uh you know you meet people you'd never you'll you'll never meet anywhere else mm-hmm. and uh I, it's funny I, I took my son out uh to shoot with me we went to this abandoned military base mm-hmm. um this was uh i think it was like last month and we were out there, and I gave him a camera, and I said, you know, you shoot some pictures, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was like, Dad, man, uh, taking pictures have taken you to some cool-ass places. And I was like, yeah, you know what? It has. Mm-hmm. It has. We went to, uh, um, 
what is that, that uh, Salvation Mountain. Mm -hmm. You know, we went there and, and took pictures over there, and that was a mission. Nice. Uh, it was, we made the mistake of going in the summer, oh, and it was so, so it was hot. hot out there. We got uh, attacked by flies. Our car was like literally millions of flies inside the car. Are you uh, yeah, man. There we must had, have been something dead in there. Dude, it, no, <laughs> it was the soda. We had soda, open uh, soda cans, and we left the windows open. Oh, oh, I thought you meant like an abandoned car with no, flies. Man. I would have been worried. <laughs> I was like, there's something in no, there. No, man, but I ended up having to jump in the car and do donuts. To get, all the flies. to get all the flies out, man. <laughs> <laughs> you should have took shots of that. It was, it was awesome. It was cool, man. But it sucked as far as the heat and everything. Oh, wow. but I, I definitely want to go back and do some more pictures, but we'll, I want to go back in the winter when it's nice. Nice. Yeah, but, I mean, the the it's just amazing. An amazing feeling to be able to print something out that, that you created, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I think if more people did it, and it it would I don't know man it made people happier I think yeah it, it's really cool because that's like a, like you said it, it's self expression and a way to express yourself and find something that you know clicks well with you with yeah. you know with something that you see in your mind like you said uh, imagination and you can go any way with it and what's cool is like not one person is alike so what you do no one could duplicate that. Yeah, you know, well, unfortunately, like social media, man, if you scroll through social media, everybody has the same pictures. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the same style. Oh, that's because they're biting each other. Yeah. You know? that's, that's what it is. I, so I've been kind of like not looking through much, mm -hmm. you know. I'm trying to like slowly step away from all that mm -hmm. just so I can be my own creative. Yeah. You know, create my own style. I don't want to. Uh, bite everybody else's style. Yeah, you kind of want to just do your own thing and get your own feel for it because when it's like that, like, and people see it, it's so unique because it's its own, it's its own style and it stands yeah. out on its own. And I, I I tend to need to do the same. You know, the more it's okay to to browse and, and and like other people like that you support and you follow, but you gotta you gotta like step away and just try to create what you can, what you're feeling. Yeah, don't like, be really. so influenced by somebody else's work. Yeah, you got to be I your mean, own influence. Be motivated by their work, but don't be influenced to the point where you're doing the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And I see that a lot, especially <coughs> with, like, younger photographers, mm -hmm. that, you know, with their dangling their feet over the buildings and stuff. <laughs> like, that. that's everybody's doing it. Yeah. It's like, okay, I mean, don't get me wrong, that's it's cool as hell, but... But do something different. Yeah, you know, <laughs> dang know. your head, dangle your head off. Dangle the your head. <laughs> do one arm. Yeah. <laughs> Take a selfie that way. If there's anything you could tell your younger self, what would it be? Um, pay attention in school. <laughs> I would uh, definitely say do your homework, pay attention in school, because you're gonna regret it when you get older. Yeah, you know, and when you're young, it doesn't seem like a big deal. Mm -hmm. And once you're out, that's when you realize, damn, I should have paid attention. Yeah, education is is helpful, and yeah. I'm I'm seeing that myself now too because we are in a generation where, you know, a higher education is required in society now. Not just like the basic essentials that it was or the the basics. It's like it's it's crazy because it's so competitive now. Yeah. We live in such a competitive society that the having the basics is like not enough. You know, yeah. and even then too, though, having an education sometimes isn't the key to succeeding. Yeah. Too, there's so been it's like plenty of of uh, college graduates that are that are uh, homeless or or not jobless. doing a, a, the same thing that they studied for. Yeah, now they're only, in all this debt. Yeah, and that's that's another side of it too. Not just that, but also, um, you know, working a job that they're overqualified for. Yeah, that, or, you know, or having to take an entry level position when they're like way beyond entry level you know so yeah. it's it's really tough it goes back and forth um for anybody listening that would want to get into photography or or pursue film photography what could you recommend to them or what kind of advice could you give them if they're just wanting to start off or they don't know you know how to go about getting into it you know what could have, kind of advice could you give them um i'd say research uh, because like I know a lot of people want to buy the most expensive equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for film photographers, like Leica is the, is the big 
you know, the the gold in film photography, and that's super expensive, man. Mm. The bodies alone cost you thousands of dollars, and it's like it's cool and all. Don't get me wrong; I'd love to have one, mm. but I'm I can do without. Mm. You know, start with what you can afford. Don't go above your above your uh, pay raise or yeah. whatever you can afford. You, you gotta you gotta go within your budget. Yeah, like start there. Like mm. just create with what you got. Mm-hmm. And then build it. And once you start growing, then you start getting equipment. Once you start figuring it out. Because, like, when I did it, I wanted to buy all the equipment right away. Like, I had my lighting. I had, um, you know, the the studio stuff and all this and that and all the bells and whistles. But I didn't know what I was doing. Hmm. And now that I do, I rarely use it. And you're using less. Yeah. It's like the, the – like, my, my go-to camera is – is just a little small camera that I carry around, and um, you know I take pictures with it, and that's it. And that my all my other my other equipment I'll take occasionally, mm-hmm. but like just just do your research, yeah, and and buy what you can afford, and build off of that. Like learn learn the equipment before you go and step up to something you know more expensive exactly yeah like my first camera i think was a a canon rebel Mm -hmm. you know and i still have that camera Mm -hmm. Uh, i'll probably never get rid of it just because it was my first one yeah you know and uh i learned to i learned to use that like crazy Mm -hmm. and and then I, i i stepped up to another canon camera and i've been using that ever since Mm -hmm. and then i uh i think this year i bought my first fuji uh the fuji x 100f and i love that camera it's mm-hmm. a great uh, street photography camera and uh then i started buying my film cameras mm-hmm. and i got my mamiya 645 um and i got my mamiya c 330 mm-hmm. and i love those cameras. and those are your film uh yeah. cameras right yeah and those make amazing beautiful images and they're the the cameras weren't too expensive. They weren't uh, that expensive. Uh, the film is still out there, so that's cool. It's just finding the the equipment, though, right? Um, no, well, see, everybody puts vintage in front of everything, and mm-hmm. they think that it's worth a lot a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It's like slow your roll, man. You gotta do your research because a lot of these cameras they want all this money for. And you can't even find film for them anymore. Mm-hmm. So you got to know what you're buying. Mm-hmm. And um, if they still have an abundance of film for it. Yeah, if they're still even making the film. So so they're still making it or you're buying film that has already been made years no, ago? No, they're still making the film for these cameras that I bought. Oh, okay. That's nice. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the film itself, depending on what you buy, I think mine, the most expensive one is... Like the seven some seven fifty or something like that. Mm. Uh, the process is is where it costs some money, and I don't have the room for uh, like a dark room or anything. So yeah, you know I have to send it in. Uh, the color film isn't that expensive, but the black and white takes a while. Uh huh. That takes like two weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, that's cool. So I get. I bet that's like you get anxious anticipating oh yeah, when man. those come in. You're like, oh hell yeah! You got something to look forward to when they come in. You got to see your work finally, like you know, yeah, in man. I get physical to see, form. I get to see all the beautiful images and be like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> and it's cool. The guys over there at uh, Sammy's camera over in the, in Pasadena, man. I love those two dudes. Over is that there, a man. is that like a a, bu- a brick building? Yeah. Oh, I think I've been in there with my boy Wax before. Oh, probably. Yeah, we went in there and got yeah. something for. Uh, he was shooting a video for me, and I think we went in there and got something. Oh, you rented something, man? Uh, no, I think he needed to get a memory card or something. But oh, we went okay. in there and it was like all camera stuff. It was yeah, crazy. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, they have a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, there's two guys that are that I that I really like there that mm-hmm. uh, they help me out a lot. Um, super awesome crew there. Yeah, that's them, cool. Uh, yeah, they always uh, talk me into trying different. Uh, film and uh-huh. and stuff and you know give me advice and stuff when you go really in there cool. it's like a kid in a candy store huh yeah man well they see me almost every week man <laughs> i'm turning in film every time it's, like, it's getting expensive nice so for this uh section right here i call it the connection corner because i'm all about trying to reconnect with ourselves and other people um what do you what do you listen to or read 
that motivates you or that keeps you inspired or that helps you get through your work day and everything else that's going on? Mm, depends on my mood, but for the most part, I like real mellow music. Uh-huh. I like Bon Iver, mm-hmm. um, uh, like just mellow music. You know, I don't like nothing too crazy mm-hmm. uh, unless I'm on my motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about podcasts or audiobooks? Um, are you into that? I love podcasts. Podcasts are, I like paranormal podcasts. Uh-huh. Nice. Um, I like photography ones, like uh, The Candid Frame is a good one uh, where they do interviews uh, uh, for paranormal. There's one, it's called. Uh, the hell is it called, man? The, the um, son of a gun, man. Well, I listen to yours actually. <laughs> so <lot>. disconnected. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. Of course, man. But uh, let me see. Like, uh, I have um, the Confessionals. Uh huh. That's a good uh, paranormal one. That I really like. Uh, of course, Joe Rogan. Yeah, he always and got some good interviews on there. For last, I like uh, this one called. Call her daddy. You ever listen to that one? <laughs> no, nah, I think those you told girls me about are it. retarded, man. That's, that's hilarious, bro. <laughs> they talk about crazy shit. Huh? Uh, they talk about uh, stuff you don't want your daughter to do, <laughs> <laughs> but they're hilarious, man. Nice. So yeah, you guys check those out if you hear them. Um, you know, in the experience and after after everything you've been through, like, do you uh, feel like you've grown as a person? And in photography, do you feel like it's it's helped mold you as a person that you are today? Yeah. I think uh, the experience with photography has helped me connect with people. Um, it's easy to approach people, and it's easy to for me to connect with people. Mm-hmm. And um, I love it. I don't think I'd be able to without it. Nice. Um, like, I can be comfortable around complete strangers. So it's like your tool... That how like that you use to connect with people. Yeah, that's that, that's like, tight. I you know, if I can talk somebody into getting their photo taken, then that's a good sign that it, you know they're feeling me out and they're yeah they're, they're digging my my vibe. Yeah, they like your energy, and yeah. not only that, that quick conversation now may start uh, another a large yeah, conversation. Because you never know who you're gonna shoot. You yeah, know? you can be out there and you can shoot a millionaire. Mm-hmm. And they don't even, you know, you can connect. Yeah. It's just who you meet. Yeah. I mean, I never met no. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, though. Yeah, you, you never you're know. You're out there all the time. And that's yeah. what's cool is, like, just being out and about. You never know what you're going to, you know, shoot next. Yeah, that's what's You don't know what cool, you're going to see. You go out on the street and you don't know what you're going to see. Like I like I always say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to see what I see and do what I do. <laughs> you know? Is there uh, anybody you want to shout out or... Um... Um, Anything else you'd like to share? Uh, let me see. I want to give a shout out to um, my boy Jeremy, <laughs> a little man, uh, my daughter Jessica, love you boo, and of course my my rock Julie, my mm-hmm. wife. Nice. You know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do what I do. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's always when when the support system is there for you. Yeah, man. And everyone's rocking with you in your corner. It just makes it that much more exciting. It makes it easier to do what you love to do, and then it gives you even more motivation and inspiration to do it because yeah, now you man. have people uh, rocking in your corner for you. Oh yeah, man. They're always like, you know, pushing me to do what I do, and it's awesome. And then Jessica, she's been my model from day one. Nice. Yeah. So you have some someone to shoot all the time. Yeah, when you're ready to say, okay, look, I got this crazy idea. (laughs) (laughs) Those sometimes end up bad though. (laughs) Nice. Well, I I really want to thank you for coming on, Uh, and I and I appreciate your time. And it it was cool because, like, I tell everybody that that comes on, and it's a lot of the time it's mutual people, people that I've known forever, or some people that I've known for a quick minute, or people that I that I meet just by connecting socially. I learned something new about them. And like I said, it could be family, it could be friends, it could be someone I follow, look up to. And every time I have this conversation and we do the podcast, I'm learning something new when I ask questions. And it's crazy because you're like, like I said, you can know someone your whole life and you're still picking the br- their brain and learning stuff about them. So I appreciate the, sharing the conversation with you and I thank you for coming and I, and I hope people enjoy this. Yeah, well, I appreciate you, man. 
You know, I've seen you grow up since you were a little <laughs> mocoso running around and, and to uh, this fine young man that you become. Oh, man. thank it's, you. It's I didn't know cool. I was that fine to you. Oh, damn, man. <laughs> I didn't want to say nothing, but yeah. you want to move closer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank you guys for subscribing and uh, listening. And I, I just want to shout out Jose Alvarado for coming on for episode 10 of Soul Disconnected uh, Podcast. If you guys want to follow him, let them know where they could follow you at. You could follow me at... Uh, uh, Alvarado <laughs> underscore portraits. Oh, it's on, on Instagram, on, right? On Instagram, and then uh, same on Facebook, uh, Alvarado portraits. And uh, I'm on Pinterest. Pinterest is where I post most of my uh, oh, dope. I gotta my, check that my, out. My, my uh, good stuff. I have Ashley follow you on there because she's yeah. like heavy on Pinterest. Yeah, I love Pinterest, man. Pinterest is amazing. That's dope. Uh, just under Alvarado portraits. All right, for sure. And so then, again, uh, it's Alvarado underscore portraits on IG. Yeah, and then if you feel like you like my work and you want to collab, do a portrait session or something, I don't charge, man. I do it for the love. Hit me up. That's what's up. So make sure you guys go ahead and follow him. Check him out. He's a good dude, uh, part-time comedian, full-time <laughs> photographer. He does it for the love, and he's uh, serious about it, and he's a good dude, man. So make sure you guys check him out again. Jose Alvarado, Alvarado underscore portraits. You're listening to So Disconnected Podcast. The soothing sounds of <laughs> So Disconnected. Peace. Yo, it's when Tony writes. You're listening to So Disconnected Podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at So Disconnected. Tap the link in our bio to select the platform of your choice. We are also available on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, the Stitcher Radio app, TuneIn Radio app, and YouTube.